doing the right video? All right, perfect. So it's been um, four years since I stood on this stage. Um, it's been 18 years since I first came to DevOps, and it's been an amazing ride. Uh, it's amazing how much Java has evolved since then. Uh, we, um, when, when Stefan did the little poll about what version of Java people are using, uh, someone mentioned, where's 21? So how many people here are using Java 21 already? I see a few hands go up. I'm, I'm happy to see a few hands go up. I'm not surprised to see a few hands go up. Uh, you know, we've been hard at work making more Java, uh, and you know, the, 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 the latest version, uh, which was been available two, three weeks from now, is very compelling, a lot of good features in it, so I can understand why people uh, have uh, jumped on it. Uh, before I talk about Java 21, I want to talk a, a little bit about where Java comes from and how we've been able to deliver Java faster. So that means we have to talk about some old news. I, I hope I won't take up, take up too much time on this. Um, last time I was here, we were just starting out with the new six-month release cadence. So it was a uh, Java 12, Java 13 uh, time frame. Um, and so you all remember the bad old days, the way we used to do things. We had a feature box release model. Uh, releases ran two, three, four years. There were often delays. There was not that much predictability. and because the trains were so infrequent, uh, there were a lot of costs that this generated. We had to have a very um, heavyweight and expensive planning and release management model, which meant engineers spent time doing planning work and not doing, um, not doing feature work. Um, and again, because the trains were so infrequent, uh, there was this irresistible temptation for you know, a feature that maybe you've been working on for three years that's like almost ready and there's this temptation to convince yourself, well, no, it actually is ready, we're gonna put it in because no one wants to wait three more years for their feature to ship. And you know, the, 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 the result was our the release model was creating a lot of distortions for, uh, for the way we work and for the quality of the product. And it really wasn't working for, every, for anyone. It wasn't working for developers who had to wait a long time to get the features they wanted. It wasn't working for enterprises who really just wanted stability and uh, th things like late integrations reduced the stability of initial GA releases. Uh, backporting a lot of things also reduced the stability of releases. Um, and it wasn't really working for us as JDK developers either. So, you know, we took a hard look at the problem and decided we had to do something and, uh, you know, we asked the ecosystem and our customers what, what, uh, what they need. And of course, in an ecosystem as large as Java, it doesn't speak with one voice, but surprisingly, there were two very clear voices that came, that, that came out when we asked, what do we need to be doing? There was the voice of developers, and developers were very clear about we want features faster, we want del features delivered faster, we want more predictable releases, we want to know when things are coming. And enterprises were also very clear, we want stability. Once we put an application into production, we want a stable version of the JDK that we can deploy on, that we know gets security uh, fixes and critical bug fixes and absolutely nothing else because backporting features uh, risks the, risks the st stability. And the old model we had was making precisely no one happy. Developers weren't happy, enterprises weren't happy, the people who work on, on the JDK weren't happy. So we, you know, we, we revamped our model. And um, you know, not surprisingly, you know, if you have a customer base where there are sort of two clear customer profiles of what people want, um, the structure of the answer is going to have kind of two things in it. So we switched to a, a model which we call tip and tail. The tip releases are time boxed every six months. Uh, features are integrated when they're ready. If you miss the train, that's okay. There's another train coming in six months. Um, and then, of course, we offer long-term commercial support on selected older releases, the tail releases. And these get security updates and critical bug fixes only. And that makes sure that they're stable. Once you put an application in production, you don't have to worry about things changing out from under it. Now, everyone was skeptical at first. Um, people both inside the house and outside the house were, uh, were, were skeptical. Uh, folks working on the JDK said, this is crazy. We can never do this. We're never going to be able to run a release in six months. We're going to get eaten by process overhead. Um, what if we don't have anything to ship? It'll be so embarrassing. Uh, and it turned out that these issues were not really issues. They were just fears. Um, and the ecosystem was even more skeptical. Um, in fact, 
some of the people in this room made blog posts about how ridiculous our new release model was. I, I have the pictures. Um, <laughs> You know, and and you know, a lot of these, you know, sur surrounded on denial that there was more Java to make. Java 8's all I'm ever going to need, or oh, we can't possibly adopt a new release every six months. And the reality is, this is all that change is hard, um, and we fear change, and so we resist change. So, you know, when we talk about change, we're not just talking about changing our release model, although we did. Um, we really had to change our mindset. We had to change the way we think about, th think about developing, um, developing features and kind of unlearning the 20 years or so of uh, experience and muscle memory that we developed in building Java over those previous decades. And in particular, one of the hardest things I think for a lot of people on the team to, to, to really get was it's okay to miss the train. If your feature's not ready, that's fine. There's another train in six months, your feature will be ready, people will be happy to have it when it's ready. Um, we had to break ourselves of the habit of backporting everything. I'm really glad we did that. Um, but it also really changed the way we design features. And this has been uh, a little bit of a surprise for us. Uh, so features that used to be developed as big monolithic features and delivered in, in one block, we've learned how to break up into smaller but still standalone features. And this has worked out really, really well. The, um, the, you know, the big hidden benefit, you know, which most of you don't see except indirectly, is the amount of time that JDK engineers spend in release me meetings has gone almost to zero. And I won't tell you how much it was before, but the answer was way too much. Um, and if developers are spending less time in release meetings, less time doing backports, they can spend more time working on new features, and that shows up as a faster pace of progress. And all the features in Java 21, you know, that I'm going to talk about, um, would not we would not have been able to develop them as quickly and effectively. So you know the, the um, you know. This, this, this process has been a huge success. I think it's worked out better than we could have possibly hoped it would. Uh, we were able to slash our release process, like I said, almost to zero, because we had reduced the release risk so much. We were able to slash the number of backports we did because they just weren't needed anymore. Um, all of this meant more stability for LTS releases, made people more confident in adopting releases uh, the first day they were out, rather than saying, oh, well, I'll wait a year and see what happens, which is what people used to do in the six, seven, eight days. And again, this makes, all of this means more time to spend on developer, uh, de development, and that means more features. So I'd like to say everyone is happy. Uh, I've been in this industry long enough to know that no one's ever happy. But let's just say everything is awesome, OK? Uh, developers get features faster, delivered earlier, more rapidly with more predictability. Enterprises get uh, supported stable releases with security and critical bug fixes. JDK developers get to spend more time developing. And the predictability of the process and the repeatability of it reduces everybody's stress level. So, you know, this transformation was a, you know, absolute huge success. I, I wouldn't ever want to go back to the old way. Um, and at the same time, our feature pipeline is, you know, better than it ever was before. So, um, this, you know, this was the enabler for getting to all the cool features you came to hear about. So, let's talk about features. So here's a list of the features that are in Java 21. This is actually just the JEPS. Uh, obviously, there's way more to a release than just JEPS. Every release has on the order of 1,000 small improvements, performance uh, improvements, uh, n you know, um, new methods and libraries, bug fixes, things like that. Um, and uh, this is just the list of JEPS from Java 20 to Java 21. So it's just, just the features that are, that are in Java 21. They're spread out over a bunch of areas. We have new language features. We have new library features. We have new runtime features. If we zoom out and we look at what's come in since uh, Java 17, it's a slightly bigger list. It's not hugely bigger, but it's slightly bigger. If we zoom out a little bit further and look at the features since JDK 11, it's at, you, know, you, 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 you can see that we've, we've been busy. Um, and it, the, it's a little bit of an unfair comparison because it was three years between 11 and 17. Uh, at that point, we reevaluated and decided to switch to a two-year cadence for, for LTS. So uh, 17 sort of had three years to gestate. 21 had two years to gestate, so the, uh, the, 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 there's quite a few items in blue. But like you, you get the point. We've been busy. 
Um, so, you know, JEPs are how features get delivered into the JDK, but they're not necessarily how features get built. Features get built in projects in the Open JDK uh, community, um, and you know these projects sort of represent the choices that we make about what we're going to invest in. Uh, so a project may produce one JEP, it may produce many JEPs, some produce no JEPs, um, and each project sort of has a theme area and. It, it has an underlying you know, reason for being, which is almost always a pain point where we see developers um, you know, working too hard to do something that should be easier in Java. Or sometimes um, you know, uh, you know, we get a nudge from the competition where we see, oh, okay, well, you know, Julia is doing better than Java in GPU computation. Um, you know, we, 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 re we really should catch up with that. You know, and we know that Java is not going to be the best thing for everything, but we want Java to be good for all of these things. We don't want to ever give people an excuse to not use Java. And you know, Ste Stefan had some good examples of uh, you know, use, using some of the newer features you know, from 22, in, in, including preview features. Uh, um, the, uh, the the vector API and the foreign function a, um, interface to do his little um, you know to do the uh, the AI demo. So you know the, the, these these are things where we looked at you know pain points people were experiencing three, four, five, six years ago and identified what is it we can do to sort of raise up the platform and make it a better place for you know for these kind of things that people want to do. So. Let's talk about um, so, you know some of the features in, um, in in JDK 21. The big news, obviously, is Loom. Uh, Project Loom has gone final. Um, I, I sort of think Loom is going to be the the lambda of JDK 21 in that it's going to be the um, the real impetus for people to you know to upgrade from what they were doing. Obviously, you know this is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. Uh, Loom sort of takes Java concurrency to the next level by barely changing it at all. And this was really an amazing move. Um, so why did we have to do Loom in the first place? Well, Java has had threads since day one. Uh, this was one of, one of the things that distinguished Java um, uh, um, amongst other programming languages at the time that it came out, was that it embraced concurrency and had an integrated cross-platform uh, you know, concurrency model and memory model from, from day one. And threads are great. Threads are what allow us to do lots of things at once with readable sequential code, with uh, you know, um, full, full support from the language in terms of using the control flow operators the language gives you, using the error handling mechanism, the, the language gives you uh, giving you comprehensible stack traces, uh, being friendly to operating systems. Thread, threads are great. But unfortunately, threads are a little bit heavyweight. Um, threads are generally created by the operating system, and they're expensive to create. They drag around megabyte scale data structures, and most operating systems will only let you create a few thousand. And this means there's a sort of a collision course between the comfortable um, task, you know, thread per task programming model, which lets us write readable uh, sequential code, and wanting to use the machines efficiently. Um, some people were, you know, in the last few years, been reaching for reactive async frameworks, which offer better scaling. But those frameworks come at a very significant cost. The programming model is. Well, awful. Uh, they're hard to debug. Uh, stack traces are incomprehensible, and we knew there was a better way. So we wanted to stop putting developers in a situation where they had to choose between being efficient developers and efficient users of uh, computing hardware. So the answer that, um, that that Loom has for this is what we call virtual threads, uh, and and the answer is simply, well, if threads are too heavyweight, make them lighter. Well, that sounds easy, right? That sounds like one of those people who say, well, I would just write a program with no bugs in it. Uh, but the thing is, we actually pulled it off. Uh, so virtual threads are real threads, but they're much lighter weight because they don't drag around these huge megabyte scale data structures. They store their threads, thread stacks as delimited continuations in the garbage collected heap. Uh, the stacks are pay as you go, so the smallest, uh, you know, a, when, when, you, when you start a virtual thread, you're, you're paying maybe a couple hundred bytes. And these things can scale to like a million concurrent connections on a laptop like this one. But they're not some other weird abstraction. They're real threads. They implement Java Lang thread. They support thread local. All your thread code just runs. You get clean stack traces. You get clean thread dumps. Uh, you get all the things that you would expect from Java. You get single step debugging and profiling. All your code just works. 
Um, and you know, the, 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 the point of this is not to make your application go faster. Virtual threads won't make your, uh, threads go, your, your code go faster, but it will make it scale better. So most, uh, in most server applications, most requests spend most of their time waiting on I.O. I.O. on a socket, I.O. on a file, I.O. for the database. Um, and if we program with a comfortable thread per task model, uh, and uh, and most of those most of those tasks are waiting on I/O. Eventually, we're going to run out of threads before we run out of CPU, and that's because um, we, we we run out of threads because we've run out of memory. And this ra effectively raises the cost of deployment because we're using a lot of memory and we're not using the CPU resources very efficiently. So this graph kind of visualizes what the benefit is. You know, um, we we have some. IO bound, uh, IO bound tasks in a thread pool. So the blue line represents a thread pool with, uh, with 200 threads. Uh, when, when load gets presented on the application, latency is fine until all the threads are busy, and then latency falls apart. If you say, oh, well, let's just put more threads in the thread pool, that's what the green line represents, uh, or I guess the light blue line represents. Um, and that gets better, but again, it has the same behavior. You hit the bottleneck uh, of how many threads can I have before you run out of CPU, and latency again falls off a cliff. The uh, virtual threads line, you can barely see it. It's the green line that's running near the x-axis. Um, it's going to keep going until you run out of CPU. Eventually, it'll fall apart, but like somewhere over there in the next theater. So virtual threads you know, are designed you know, to, m to model a single task. They're not designed to model a mechanism for running, uh, for running tasks. So we need to unlearn a little bit of what we've learned about, about concurrency. Um, you know, there's a lot of intuition that we've built up about concurrency over the last you know, however many years uh, that, we're, that we're going to have to unlearn. For example, um, we, we've learned that we're supposed to pool threads. Well, virtual threads, you should definitely not pool them. They're so cheap, just make one when you need one. Make one for every task, make one for every async uh, you know, operation. Um, but you know, we, we think that this will obviate the need for people to, um, you know, to use uh, async reactive frameworks. Um, you don't need to change paradigms. We just needed to make threads better. Uh, so the, um, the, the surface change for Project Loom and virtual threads is actually quite small uh, because the virtual threads implement the, the Java Lang thread class. But under the water, a tremendous amount has changed. We had to do uh, a lot of work to retrofit basically every blocking operation in the JDK to be aware of virtual threads. And when uh, code running a, a, in a virtual thread blocks, uh, we suspend the thread, passivate it, stack to the heap, and, uh, and, and, and bring in, ask the scheduler to bring in another virtual thread. This all happens transparently. It's all un un under the water. But there was a tremendous amount of work uh, in the JDK to make all this possible. And Alan is going to talk about this tomorrow at, uh, at 1.50. One of, the, um, one of the really cool things about Project Loom, I think is going to be kind of the sleeper feature of Project Loom, is um, that it's an enabler for sort of a new paradigm for concurrency, which, which is called structured concurrency. This isn't something we invented. This is something that's been uh, experimented with in a lot of other language communities, the Python community, the C++ community. And it's a really simple concept. It's like so simple, it makes you wonder, why didn't we think of this years ago? Which is, uh, if you have a control flow that splits, uh, it should re rejoin with its children in the same lexical scope. In other words, parents should wait for their tr children. Seems like a reasonable thing to do. Um, and uh, the benefit of this is that it makes all the things that are really hard with threads. Uh, so if anybody's read chapter seven of Java Concurrency in Practice, most difficult chapter of the book. It's on cancellation and shutdown. Also, probably the least satisfying chapter of the book from my perspective, because there wasn't a lot of science there. There were just a lot of tricks for how to get things to work. This this is the science that was missing: is having a discipline that allows um, that allows task management to be compositional, and it makes things like deadlines, timeouts, error handling just absolutely trivial. Um, and but it only makes sense because threads are so cheap now. I'm not going to go through the code example. Alan, Alan will do that uh, tomorrow. But uh, there's, there's also, a, uh, in preview, a simple, uh, simple API for structured concurrency um, in, in JDK 21 as well. But I'm really excited about this. 
All right, so I'm going to switch topics a little bit. I'm staying on the topic of runtime and performance. Um, I want to talk about some improvements in the, the Z garbage collector. So the Z garbage collectors was introduced in JDK 15. How many people here are using ZGC? Few people, OK. So how many people hate garbage collection pauses? All right, so some people should look into ZGC. So ZGC um, is a new garbage collector that supports terabyte scale heaps with sub-millisecond garbage collection pauses. And these pauses don't scale with heap size or live set. Um, and you know, as you would expect from a modern garbage collector, it has almost all the buzzwords, concurrent, parallel, region-based, compacting, NUMA aware, blah, 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 blah. Uh, but the upshot of it is, we pretty much don't have to think about GC pauses anymore, which is kind of what we've been hoping for, you know, for thir 30 years. So sounds great, right? What's the catch? Well, there's a reason we have so many garbage collection algorithms, and that is that garbage collection is always a trade-off. It's a trade-off between latency and throughput and memory utilization and predictability and, and locality and any number of other things. So there is a cost. Um, Applications running ZGC take about a 2% throughput hit compared to G1, which is pretty small if you care about pauses, and probably you know not so small if you don't care about pauses. So we're not getting rid of the other collectors. It also uses more memory, um, you know. But it, but again, if you really care about predictability and latency, the, you know ZGC may very well be a good alternative. Um, so. Um, I have, uh, have some data here on pause times that were taken from the spec JBB 2015 benchmark, uh, running G1 and ZGC, um, looking at average and P95 and P9, P99 latencies. And the, the G1 latencies are in the realm of uh, three, four, 500 milliseconds, and the ZGC, well, well we can't see those. Um, okay, so let's zoom in, um, switch the scale off to micro, microseconds instead of milliseconds, and scroll down, hi Duke. Um, and you know, we see that the you know for the for the for the same benchmark, the ZGC numbers are on the order of a couple hundred microseconds. And like I said, these don't scale. They they um, in this case, not scaling is a good thing. These don't. If you have a larger heap, pauses don't get bigger. If you have more live objects in your heap, pauses don't get bigger because it doesn't actually do any GC work during the pause. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it, ZGC, like I said, has been part of the JDK since JDK 15. Um, and, you know, in JDK 21, we've improved it to add generational capability. Um, so the one buzzword that was missing from that buzzword list that I went through very quickly uh, was generational. Uh, so the original ZDC was single generation. In JDK 21, we've added generational capability to ZGC. The upshot of which is one of the trade-offs that I mentioned, which is using more memory, is um, has been vastly improved. So uh, you know, for example, we took um, tip, uh, the Cassandra benchmark uh, and and found that for the uh, for the same amount of throughput on a single machine, we were able to see a 75% reduction in memory utilization uh, you know, for, for, the, for the same throughput. So um, ZGC is great, getting better with every version. The other collectors we're not ignoring either, right? So if you're using G1 or you're using Parallel, um, these are also continuously under improvement. Um, so uh, this again, same uh, same benchmark, spec JBB 2015, um, big improvement in throughput um, from eight to 17, somewhat smaller, but still non-zero improvement in throughput from uh, 17 to 21 as well. All right, another, um, another thing that, that's been going on for probably six, maybe seven years uh, at this point that, uh, that is coming to uh, fruition is Project Panama. These are the technologies that, uh, that Stefan was talking about in his AI, AI demo. Uh, Project Panama is about, or at least in part, uh, part about, better access to native memory, that's memory outside the Java heap, and native code, that is code that, doesn't, you know, that isn't managed by the JVM. Now, if you've been programming in Java for a long, long time, you'll remember that we used to discourage native code. There was that branding campaign about pure Java, and pure Java was great, and, and all of that. And that's true, but um, there are some great native libraries out there as well. Uh, and they're not going to get rewritten in Java, and they shouldn't be rewritten in Java. So if you're doing you know, off CPU computation with CUDA, or you're doing graphics with OpenGL, or you're doing you know, linear algebra with BLAST, um, you should be able to just 
use those libraries from Java, and it shouldn't be as painful as it is now. So you can do those things today, but it is painful. How many people here have used JNI? Wow, I'm sorry. Uh, so JNI is awful. Um, a lot of you know this. Uh, some of you are getting the, getting the idea. Uh, you have to code in this horrible combination of Java and C. Um, it's difficult to maintain. It's super easy to make mistakes for which you get very very poor error feedback. Except, oh, I crashed my JVM. Right. So. That's not the good programming experience we want people to have. Um, and similarly, the experience of programming uh, with off-heap memory, not quite as bad as it with JNI, but byte buffers are not fun and unsafe isn't, isn't great. Um, byte buffers are limited to two gigabytes. They have all kinds of limitations. And unsafe is, well, obviously it's unsafe and it's eventually going away. Um, and so Panama has been built you know, from the ground up for, for both safety and performance. Um, so you get a uh, highly optimized uh, bounds checking, uh, both spatial and temporal bounds checking, so uh, protection against buffer overruns, protections against used after for free, but in a way that uh, these checks get hoisted away and optimized away by the compiler routinely, so you're not really paying anything for them. And the, uh, the programming experience is also a lot more pleasant than that of, uh, you know, given by JNI or, or, or unsafe. Um, Panama isn't quite out of preview yet. It's probably in, it's hopefully, in its last preview in 21. We'll go final in 22. I know I'm not supposed to say things like that, so pretend I didn't say that. Um, but uh, you know, it, it, it represents a, a big payoff from investments that we've been making over the last decade, because it's built on investments we've been making in, in the JVM, method handles, var handles, uh, you know, to, um, you know, to, to get a lot of the performance it gets. And you know, so years ago when we said eventually, oops, eventually unsafe was going away. Well, we're not going to do that until there's a safe supported alternative. Panama is one of the vehicles that are bringing us safe supported alternatives for, uh, for unsafe. Uh, what we really hope will happen with Panama is that people who maintain uh, native libraries or um, others in the community will routinely wrap these native libraries with good Java APIs and distribute those uh, with the library or separately from the, the library so that Java developers don't have to do that themselves. Um, and so if you want to hear more about Panama, there's a couple of talks from Oracle folks. Uh, um, a pair is uh, talking about um, foreign function and memory uh, access on Friday. And uh, Jose is talking about uh, SIMD program with programming with the Vector API uh, tomorrow. All right, so let's talk about something uh, a little bit closer to what I personally work on, which is the, the, the Java language. Uh, since I last stood on this stage, here are the JEPs that Project Amber has delivered or is working on. So we've been busy. Um, and uh, in, 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 case you, you know, um, in case you don't know, Project Amber is sort of the umbrella project for these small productivity-oriented language features, although some of them are not small. Um, but unlike some of the other projects in OpenJDK, it's an ongoing project that keeps pumping out good stuff, whereas most projects uh, sort of have a goal, they eventually deliver, and, uh, and, and then they wrap up. Um, so, this is a long list of things. They may look like a grab bag of whatever we were interested in working on in the moment, but there's actually a cluster of these features uh, that uh, that kind of work together. So each of these features stand alone. They're standalone features, you know, um, on their in their own right. But they were designed to work together. They were designed together, and they likely would have been one big feature under the old release model. And I don't have time to go through all of these features or even any of these features right now. I will be going through. Um, uh, a lot of these features in my language uh, futures talk on Friday, but uh, but I do want to just uh, give a code example to give you a flavor of how all of these features have come together to make programming in Java more pleasant. So. Um, the, um, the, the theme of the features that I highlighted in blue and, and why they're sort of all part of the same, um, you know, the same family is making Java better about working with data. Um, these features are all about modeling and processing plain data. Uh, so records and sealed types uh, give us algebraic data types. Pattern matching gives us a much more pleasant way to do visitation over algebraic data types. Uh, so visitor without the visitors, um, and a bunch of other language features have been upgraded uh, along the way to make, this, uh, to make this easier. And why are we doing this now? Well, 
the way we program has changed. You know, 15, 20 years ago, we wrote these big monoliths that were Java end to end. Even if, um, you know, if, they, if programs talk to each other, they exchange serialized Java objects. The whole domain model was defined by, by Java objects. But today, program units are smaller. They're not all written in Java. Very often, our domain model isn't defined by Java objects, but by untyped data like JSON or YAML or C uh, SQL result sets. And we need a better way of dealing with plain old data that we can convert to and from the wire and still get the benefit of Java's strong static type system when you're working on it in your program. So um, here's an example of these features sort of all put together. Um, you know, so textbook example, modeling and expression, where we say an expression is either the sum of two expressions or the product of two expressions or the negation of an expression or a constant, right? Everyone's seen this textbook example. And if we want to evaluate this uh, a, a, an expression, well, there was kind of a hint there where I said an expression is this or this or this or that. So we're going to have to deal with all the cases. And we're using sealed types and records to model this domain. So the, 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 the sealed type uh, is the part that's enforcing the an expression is this or that or that and nothing else. And then each of the alternatives is modeled by a record that allows us to strongly type what each of those cases are. So a sum is the sum of two other expressions. A negation is the negation of one other expression. And if we're going to evaluate an expression, we can say, all right, well, we have, um, we have an instance of a sealed type. Let's switch over it. Um, I can use record patterns to deconstruct each of these cases. If it's a sum expression, then get me the left and right sub-expressions, evaluate each of them, add them together. That's the result of evaluating this. Same thing for product, negation, evaluate the sub-expression, negate it. Um, and uh, if, if, if you guys remember, uh, the last time I was here, the keynote that I did, uh, actually the year before that, in 2018, I showed this example um, as well, but it was all fantasy. It wasn't working yet. This is all now working in, in Java 21. So the story that we've been telling for the last few years is, is being delivered. Um, and this, you know, there are like six or seven features, each of which have their own JEP, that are represented in this code. We have switch expressions, we have sealed types, we have records, we have uh, patterns and switch, we have record patterns. Notice we don't have to have a default clause in the switch because the compiler knows that an expression is a sum or a product or a negation or a constant, and you've covered all the cases, and so you don't have to have a default clause. In fact, you don't want to have one because you want to engage the strong like, exhaustiveness checking that the compiler can give you. So um, as a little touchstone for like, how are we doing on uh, improving, imp improving Java, I, I, I always look at how some of these thing, examples might be written in other languages that people point to and say, that's how I want to do it. So if you're wondering what this looks like in Haskell, well, it's not all that different. It's about four lines shorter. Three of them are empty closing braces, so I think we're doing pretty well. Okay, I'm not going to go through the Haskell code. Uh, so, a um, couple other things that we're doing that um, that don't always show up, um, you know, on the JEP list uh, is we really uh, we really want to make um, we're making a big investment in where is the next generation of Java developers coming from. We want um, we want to make sure that students have a good experience uh, le learning Java um, and. Uh, you know, Stefan did the uh, IDE survey about uh, what IDEs we, uh, we all use. IntelliJ was, you know, top of the list as expected. I've been using IntelliJ for 20 years, and I think it's probably the finest piece of software I've ever used. Um, so we as Java developers are very lucky with our IDEs, but not everybody wants to use a Java-centric IDE. And in particular, a lot of schools are uh, using uh, lighter weight IDEs like uh, Visual Studio Code because they because it, it runs on the Chromebooks that, uh, that's, that that students are using, and it supports all the languages that uh, you know that they want to teach in. Um, until now, there hasn't really been a very good Java uh, environment for Visual Studio Code. There is one, but it hasn't been very well supported. Um, and so we're announcing Oracle is. Um, is distributing a, uh, a, pl a platform extension for VS Code that's based on uh, the, the NetBeans work, which is in turn based on the, the, the Java C compiler. So it supports all uh, Java language features out of the box, including preview features, has great interop with build tools and testing framework, and should be in the VS Code marketplace um, maybe this week.
So um, if you use VS Code, you should definitely check this out. Um, similarly, in terms of uh, you know reducing the uh, the bar for access to Java, we've um, we've launched the Java Playground at dev.java, which is a browser-based REPL uh, based on JShell. So uh, don't don't have to install even an IDE or a, or a JDK. Just can you know uh, open up a web-based uh, JShell and 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 start playing around. All right, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about safety. Um, so when I learned to drive, uh, seatbelt use uh, was not required in the US. Uh, it, was, it was optional. Then pretty soon after that, the regulations came along, and most people took this as a helpful nudge of like, OK, yeah, I know it's good for me. OK, I'll do it. But there was also a vocal minority, you might know some of these people, uh, who chose instead to use this as an opportunity to complain about governmental overreach and, and per intrusion on personal freedom and, and all of that. Uh, but you know, 30 years later, the statistics are really clear. Most people wear their seatbelts, and a lot fewer people die on the highway. Um, so I bring up seatbelts, because we've used the seatbelt metaphor before. When we did uh, modularity in Java 9, we described it as a seatbelt, not a jetpack. But the analogy was kind of lost at the time, because um, in, you know, at, at that point, there really were no jetpacks in evidence. There were just seatbelts, and no one really wants to put on their seatbelt when they're not moving. Uh, but the seatbelt of Java 9, which is that internals can be actually kept internal, that platform internals can be evolved, I isn't there because we want to wag our fingers and say, keep out of our code. It's there because we want to move faster. So in the early days of Java, most boundaries like access control were really more like suggestions uh, than requirements. And a lot of libraries like took advantage of this flexibility and did some very cool things with it. But it didn't take very long before this started to be a drag on our ability to evolve the platform um, because we couldn't freely evolve you know, our, our internal implementation. And I, I know personally, in the Java 6, 7, 8 timeframe, um, this, this was a real problem. This was really slowing us down because uh, you, know, you would do something that seemed harmless, like taking, turning a private field of some non-public JDK class for, and, and make it, you know, uh, from mutable to final, and that breaks some library because they're breaking in with, um, you know, with 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 set accessible and uh, and binding tightly to uh, platform internal implementation. So we left that in the past with Java 9, um, and the rapid pace of innovation that I'm talking about today is the Jetpack that we were promising then. Loom is the Jetpack. ZGC is the Jetpack, and you know it's nice to think that maybe we can have Jetpacks without seatbelts. But the reality is we could not possibly have delivered these features so quickly, so reliably, so effectively without the seatbelt. So you know, by writing in, in Java today, your application gets a steady stream of improvements. Tomorrow, delivered incrementally and compatibly, and you can upgrade to you know, Java 21 and get all the benefits of ZGC without changing your code, or get the benefits of Loom with making small changes to your code. That is, if you can upgrade. Now, I hear you thinking, wait, wh what are you talking about? Java's all about the compatibility. Why is the ability to upgrade even a problem? Well, it's a problem because of dependencies. We all have some direct dependencies in our applications, and those dependencies invite their friends, and we have some indirect dependencies. And most of the time, these libraries have no trouble upgrading to the latest JDK, but a small number can't because they're dependent on unsupported platform internals. And it only takes one dependency uh, to keep the whole application from being able to upgrade. And that might be a library that you'd never even heard of. You didn't even know it was part of your application. It was just one of the libraries that you use invited it along to the party. So the good news is the jetpacks are going to keep coming. But I think we have a challenge ahead of our, our, ourselves, and, we, and one that we have to navigate together as a community, which is how do we manage the transition to universal seatbelt use so that we can all ride the jetpack and do so safely? And so the challenge that applications are seeing in upgrading uh, you know, it generally comes from a small fraction of libraries, and usually those libraries are using APIs that were restricted or removed uh, in later JDK versions. And you know, we don't remove things gratuitously. We, you know, we, we 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 do it very carefully. We do it very slowly. And when we do, there's almost always a safe supported alternative. 
Um, and you know, we saw an example of this earlier, where, where which was off-heap memory access through unsafe. People are doing that with unsafe now, and, and that's being replaced by a better alternative from Project Panama. So replacing something with a better something should be a good thing, um, but it puts libraries that use uh, you know, the old unsupported API kind of in a bind because it's hard to support both the old way and the new way um, in a single code base. But the problem isn't that something got replaced or removed. The problem is the libraries are still clinging to the old release model. So they're trying to have one code base that's one size fits all. They're trying to have one release train for everything in, in the name of convenience. Uh, but this is often a false economy and causes friction elsewhere in the ecosystem. And as the JDK moves faster, you know, the greater the impact of this impedance mismatch is going to be. And so if we have an impedance mismatch, obviously the solution is let's eliminate the impedance mismatch. And so I'm sort of issuing a challenge to uh, the Java ecosystem, which is think about aligning to the tip and tail model that has been so successful for the JDK. This is actually really simple to do. You have um, you know, a, a tip version that's baselined on a relatively recent um, you know, JDK version, probably an LTS, could be 17, could be 21, I don't care. Um, and you have a LTS train that's baselined on some older LTS version for, um, you know, that's gonna receive you know, uh, critical bug fixes and security fixes only. And this split really benefits everyone and would benefit everyone even more if libraries adopted the same, um, the same release model that the JDK did. Uh, so developers who want the latest features, they can use the tip of the JDK and the tip of their libraries. Uh, enterprises who want stable deployments can use you know, the LTS of the JDK and the LTS of these libraries. And the ecosystem would be aligned around a single model. Now, it sounds like I'm exporting a bunch of work on the library maintainers. Who here maintains uh, an open source library? So it sounds like I'm making more work for you guys, but I'm actually making less work for you guys. This is so much easier than it looks. Um, and it's probably so much easier than what you're doing now. And we're starting to see some, you know, some green shoots of this in the ecosystem that forward-looking libraries like Spring are starting to adopt this approach and, and I think are having good, um, good results with it. So I would expect to get all the same skepticism that we got uh, originally when the JDK switched release models. Um, but you know, I'm here to tell you, like, I was wrong about it then. I, you know, I was giving all those same excuses about, oh, this will never work, that everyone else was, and boy, was I wrong. Um, and you know, those, those, you know, th those objections were largely based on the misperception that, oh, it must be more work to do it this way. In reality, it's less work to do it this way. If you have an LTS and you're only backporting the most critical bug fixes, maintaining an LTS isn't that hard. If you have a tip that's baselined on a latest JDK, well, you get to use all the cool things in the latest JDK. That's gonna make your development easier, faster, and a lot more fun. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 the problem is not that the JDK is changing. The problem is that libraries are trying to have a one-size-fits-all release model where they're supporting JDK 8 and JDK 21, and that's forcing them into a least common denominator, which doesn't benefit anybody. When a library says, I only work on 8, you're basically saying, my users have to choose between my library and ZGC. And that's a bad choice. We shouldn't pe put people in that choice. Okay, so I'm um, starting to wrap up here. I wanna do a little bit of a look ahead at something that we're, we've just started working on recently, which is Project Leiden, uh, which is about um, improving startup and warm up of Java applications. Um, and historically, Java has favored long-term peak performance over startup, uh, which historically was actually a really good trade-off for applications that you know, ran for months and months and months. Um, and as a result, you know, Java does a lot of work at startup, you know, low, uh, parsing class files and interpretation and JIT compilation, profile gathering, um, symbolic linkage of call sites, you know, things like that. Um, and so the, the cost of the, um, you know, the trade-off that we made is that a startup and warm-up uh, for you know, short-running applications can suffer. Um, and of course, we want you know, Java to be good for everything, so we don't want to just say that's the way it is. We want to give people some good choices. So here's a, you know, um, 
a way to think about us, you know, start up and warm up. If you have an application that is like doing a task repeatedly, you expect the first iteration of your task to do more work because it has to get everything set up. And then thereafter, um, you know, you sort of approach a steady state where there's a small incremental amount of work for each task. The green line represents a sort of ideal. The yellow line represents the sort of uh, uh, practice. The area under the first uh, data point represents startup, and the area under the other data points represents warm up. So, if we want to push these curves down and improve our startup and warm up time, um, the, uh, the obvious thing to do is to take some of that work that's happening at startup and warm up and shift it off the critical path. Uh, this could either be later in time by being more lazy, or earlier in time by shifting work to um, a build time phase. And this kind of work shifting is old hat for the JDK. JDK employs many, many work shifting techniques. Constant folding, garbage collection, lazy class loading, JIT compilation, these are all time shifting techniques. Um, and so we can build on this, um, you know, this approach that's sort of in the DNA of, of the JVM to shift more work from runtime to, uh, you know, to, a, to an earlier phase. Uh, and so, you know, we did an experiment where we took uh, existing components in the JDK, the JIT compilers, and the uh, class data sharing um, uh, startup cache uh, mechanism to um, to basically cache more things in the CDS archive than we currently cache. So currently, CDS caches things like class metadata and we taught it how to cache compiled code and uh, resolved, um, you know, resolve constant pool entries and call site linkage and things like that. Um, and you know, the, the nice thing about this approach is no changes to your code, runs 100% of existing Java code, no loss of Java's natural dynamism. You just have to do a little bit more work at build time so that you can do less work at runtime. Um, I have um, two, um, two graphs I'll show you and then I'll wrap up. So. Uh, the first one was applying this to um, uh, Java C. So Java C is generally a relatively short running uh, task. Fun fact, Java C usually doesn't get out of the interpreter. Most of the compilation you do, it's, it's, um, it's finished compiling before it has to jit anything. Uh, but, um, you know, so, so, so in, in this example, we repeatedly compiled small batches, like a, a hundred, uh, hundred small source files. And um, the, uh, the yellow line was the, uh, was the observed time with uh, you know without doing anything, and the red line represents applying uh, the techniques I talked about, which is shifting some compilation and linkage, uh, you know, to a training run prior to um, you know prior to runtime. And what we saw was basically a two x startup improvement and a significant warm up improvement um, for no no change in our code, just a little bit of configuration uh, configuration work. So that was pretty promising. Um, and uh, we applied the same, uh, the same techniques as well to Spring Boot. So this is uh, some uh, startup time numbers for the Spring Boot Pet Clinic application. Um, the, the first bar represents the baseline, just run it on JDK 22. Um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the blue and dark, light blue and dark blue lines are various, applying various um, app CDS um, you know, pre-computation of doing some compilation ahead of time, doing some class analysis ahead of time. And the last one folds in the Spring AOT tools, which does some Spring-specific um, uh, analysis and, and shifts some of the, uh, the, the Spring startup work ahead of time. And when you take all of these together, we were able to get, um, you know, over a 4x uh, startup improvement. Again, no change to existing code. So these are very promising numbers, but it's very early days. I'll be talking more about this at uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon on my Project Leiden update. So as uh, Stefan mentioned, there are a lot of folks from the uh, Oracle Java team here at, uh, at DevOps, as well as you know, lots and lots of sessions on JDK 21. So um, I was only able to scratch the surface uh, you know, the, the, you know, very briefly in this talk. So if you want to hear more, come to these sessions this week. Thank you very much. Have a great conference. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you.